Let's take a look at preferred stocks and convertible securities. Now, I say it's chapter 18, but really it's not. It's just a few pages out of chapter 18. Pretty much everything is from this presentation, so make sure you understand this presentation. Preferred stock and convertible securities. Don't they sound exciting? Preferred. Hmm. Convertible. Wow. Nope. <laughs> As we'll see, they're not really for you and I, not really for you and me, individual retail investors. They're mostly, well, at least preferred stock, mostly for corporations. Let's get started on slide number two. What are preferred stock? Stocks that have a prior claim ahead of common stocks on the income and assets of the issuing firm. They're also called hybrid securities, fixed income stocks. You see, preferred stocks normally pay a fixed dividend, a percentage of the par value, in much the same way as a bond pays a fixed interest amount. However, preferred stocks represent equity. Therefore, they don't count as debt on the corporate balance sheets. Does that make sense? That's the reason we call them hybrids, because they look a little bit like a stock, and they look a little bit like a bond. And they exist in between stocks and bonds. In the case of a corporate default, preferred stocks have priority over common stockholders, but are subordinate to bonds. You see? Now, why do they call them preferred? I don't know. I think it has something to do with the fact that they are ahead of common stockholders but i really wish they wouldn't call them that because then people think well isn't that what i want don't i want preferred stock instead of plain old common stock uh no and we'll see why in a bit slide number three what are the advantages of preferred stock well typically they're highly predictable income streams yes the preferred stock pay a a fixed, normally, uh, fixed dividend, and they have an excellent record of meeting those dividend payments. Now, here's, here's the real reason that you and I are not really interested in them. They have tremendous tax benefits if, you're own, if they are owned by another corporation. Now, let's, let's see, what does that mean? You and I are going to have to pay taxes on the dividends that we get from preferred stock. Well, corporations, if they own preferred stock, pay a much lower tax rate on their dividends. Right. So automatically, as with municipal bonds, unless the tax benefit benefits you, that puts you at a disadvantage because somebody else for whom the tax benefit is useful can pay more for the investment right off the bat and get the same or better return than you do. So when Warren Buffett and other holding companies, his holding company is called Berkshire Hathaway, when they buy preferred stock, they get a big tax benefit that you and I don't get. Now, what are some of the disadvantages? There are a few. <laughs> they, as we said, look a little bit like bonds in that the dividend is fixed normally, so they're susceptible to inflation, much as the in interest from a bond is susceptible to inflation. Unlike bonds, though, <laughs> the dividends can be suspended or postponed, which stocks are allowed to do, and preferred stocks are stocks. The bonds must pay the interest or they get hauled off to bankruptcy court. They normally lack the potential of substantial capital gains, unlike common stocks. Why? Because common stocks will raise the dividend as things are going well. Do, do preferred stock? Normally, no. No, preferred stocks don't normally raise their dividend. And they don't pay as well as bonds. So you see, they have some of the advantages of stocks and bonds, and they have some of the disadvantages of, st of stocks and bonds. That's why we call them hybrid securities. Slide number four. Here's a graph that shows that normally throughout the years, preferred stock has paid less than bonds. 
Yeah, and it's almost always the case. Not, much, not a whole lot less, but less. Slide number five. The yield. Well, this should look familiar, right? <laughs> the dividend yield of preferred stock is the annual dividend income divided by the stock price. Much is the same as the current yield on a bond, right? Or the dividend yield on common stocks. You take the annual dividend income and divide it by the market price. So let's see an example. Two dollars annual dividend yield, um, dividend income. The current market price of this. The preferred stock is $27.50. So you divide the $2 by $27.50 and you get 7.27%. Now is that typical? Nah, it's a little high, but but sometimes they pay really well. In fact, we mentioned Warren Buffett. In the calamity of 2008-2009, he swooped in and bought $5 billion of preferred stock from Goldman Sachs and five billion dollars worth of preferred stock from GE because they both needed some serious cash quickly <laughs> and he had it and he got I'm not exactly sure what the yield was on the GM stock that he got the preferred stock but on the the Goldman Sachs stock the preferred the yield on the preferred stock was 10 percent and as we're going to see, the dividends on preferred stocks are normally paid before the common stockholders. In fact, they often have to be paid. That's part of the uh, provisions. So he was getting a really good return. Uh, but eventually, Goldman bought back the shares. That was part of the deal they made. But they had to pay an extra $500 million as a penalty to buy back the shares. Ooh. You think they were hard up for cash? Yes, they were. Uh, Buffett looked like a genius on that one. Slide number six. Pricing. As with bonds, the prices fluctuate mostly inversely to interest rate. Although with preferred stock, there's a greater risk of non-payment. Why? Because they're stock. And the dividends are not mandatory. Unlike bonds, as we said, where the bond issuer is in default if the interest is not paid. So if we do the um, pricing, this should look familiar, right? This is the dividend income divided by the prevailing interest rates. That's the basically the zero growth model. That's the zero growth model. If we're getting $2.50 of income and prevailing interest rates or as we did when we did the zero growth model, our required rate of return is 12%, which is pretty ridiculous. I don't know where we got this example from. But that would be $20.83. Okay? Question on that? Mm, check it out. It's basic, We've seen this before. Slide number seven. Let's take a look at some characteristics of preferred stock. The conversion feature of preferred stock, convertible preferred, buzz, and that sound exciting. Not only is it preferred, it's a convertible, like a convertible car with the wind blowing through your hair. And yeah, we'll discuss convertibles in detail later on in the presentation. But these convertible, convertible prefer, uh, preferred allow the holder of a preferred stock to convert to a specified number of shares of the issuing company's common stock. The investor can then share in the growth of the common stock. Hmm? Okay, we'll discuss those later on. There are some f uh, preferred that are adjustable rate or what are often called floaters, floating rate preferred where dividends are adjusted periodically in line with prevailing interest rates. So so it's, remember we taught, said that preferred are kind of like a bond because there's a fixed interest rate. Well, what happens if interest rates go up? These preferred will adjust their rate. Of course, if interest rates go down, exactly, right. Slide number eight, senior preferred versus junior. Well, this is this more the same prior preferred or preference stock. Some companies issue different classes of preferred, just as some companies have more senior bonds and more junior bonds. And the same thing was true with different classes of common stock. The same thing is true here. There's a pecking order, if you will, where some are more senior than others and get paid first. Now, here's a feature that you're going to want to make sure you understand. 
cumulative versus non-cumulative preferred. Why? Because this is a very interesting trait of some preferred stock. If you have cumulative preferred, that means that the dividends that the preferred stock pays are not mandatory and can be skipped just like a common stock, but those dividends are then said to be in arrears, which means they must be paid before any other dividends can be paid. So if you have cumulative preferred, sure, the company can say, you know what, we need cash, we can't pay any dividends. But those dividends that they would have given you, they don't go away. I mean, you might not get them, the company might go bankrupt and everything might fall into the porcelain oasis, but but those dividends are sitting there in arrears. And if the company now wants to pay dividends again, they have to go back and pay the dividend that were in arrears first before they can start paying new dividends. So obviously, what would you rather have if you're going to buy preferred stock? Right, you'd rather have cumulative because that means if they do skip the dividends, they have to come back and go back and backfill. Some people use the term backfill. They have to go back and fill and, and, and pay those dividends that they didn't pay two, three years ago or last quarter or whenever. Slide number nine, callable versus non-callable callable preferred. So remember bonds can be called, well, some preferred stock can be called. If the interest rates fall, then of course the issuer will want to refinance the preferred stock at a lower dividend rate. And then participating preferred, which is rare, allows investors to participate in earnings beyond the stated dividend rate. Why don't you just buy common stock? I don't know. What is the bottom line on preferred stock? Well, preferred stock is normally owned by corporations. Why? Because of the tax advantages. Some individual investors may acquire a taste for them. But it is in my humble opinion, for what that's worth, you and I are better off with common stock for growth and income and bonds for income. So yeah, preferred stock are hybrid securities that have some of the advantages and some of the dis uh, uh, stocks and bonds, but they also come with the disadvantages of stocks and bonds. The best and the worst of both worlds. Continuing, slide number 10. So now let's concentrate on convertible securities. And convertibles can be bonds, convertible bonds, and convertible stock. Convertible preferred stock, I should say. Pardon me. So, so that's why we waited until now. Because preferred stock can be convertible, but so can bonds. These are, slide number 10, fixed income obligations that can be converted into a specified number of shares of the issuing company's common stock. Sometimes people call it deferred equity or an equity kicker. Uh, I don't know if I like that term. The ability to share in the possible appreciation of common stock. So when you buy a bond... And the company goes really screaming hot and does really, really, what, do you get anything extra? No. You just lent your money to the, to the company and they pay you back. And that's often true with preferred stock too. You get a certain amount of interest, not, div not interest, dividends. You get a certain amount of dividends and then the, you know, company may do really well. They may not. And if they do really well, the common stock's going to explode. So for this reason, some companies issued convertible bonds, issue convertible preferred stock. And if the company's common stock zooms into the stratosphere, you can then take your, for example, $1,000 bond and convert it to, say, 20 shares of common stock. Now that number is set when the bond is created. So you get one bond, and they say, look, this is a bond. It pays 6% or whatever it pays. And it's due in 20, 30 years. But if you ever want to, you could bring your bond in and give it to us. And we will give you 20 shares of common stock. How's that sound? That, that's the equity kicker, right? So if the common stock does really well, your bond 
will now be worth more because you can convert it into stock. But it's no longer a bond anymore. If you do that, you lose the bond. Okay, you understand? Slide number 11. Conditions of the conversion feature of convertible securities. Well, there's usually a conversion period. The time period during which a convertible issue can be converted. They normally defer it for a period of years, and that makes sense because it's usually not worth anywhere near it needs to be for it to be converted anyway. So they say, well, you can't convert this for 10, 5, 10 years. The conversion ratio, as we said, is the number of shares of common stock into which the convertible security can be converted. So uh, one $1,000 bond could be converted to 20 shares or 40 shares or whatever the, it's stated in the, uh, on the bond in the bond indenture. And then the conversion price is the price at which the common stock will be delivered to the investor. So let's say you had that same $1,000 bond with 20 shares per bond you can convert it to. Well, that means the conversion price would be 1,000 divided by 20 or fifty dollars. You would not want to convert it until the stock was at worth at least fifty dollars, because that means you'd be turning in a thousand dollar bond for less than what the bond was worth, right? Yeah. Slide number twelve. The conversion value. This is an indication of what a conversion convertible issue would trade for if it were priced to sell on the basis of its stock value. So let's say we had that same 20 to 1, 20 to 1 ratio. We have a bond that could be converted 20 to 1. Well, let's say the stock price is $60. Ooh. So if we multiply the 20 for 1, 20 conversion ratio, times the market price of $60, that bond is worth to us at least $1,200 because we can turn around and convert it right now for 20 shares of stock, sell the stock and have $1,200. Right. However, in reality, the convertible bond would probably sell for more than the $1,200 because of the ability to convert to the stock. Plus, remember, it's still a bond. The bond is still inter generating interest. So what do you think it, we're going to be charged? What's called the conversion premium. Slide number 13. The amount by which the market price of a convertible security exceeds its conversion value. So the conversion premium is equal to the market price minus the actual conversion value. So how much is the bond actually selling for? Well, let's say it's an 8% $1,000 bond with that same conversion ratio of 20, per, 20 to 1 shares to 1 bond. If the stock were trading at $60, then our conversion value would be 20 times 60 or 1200 as we calculated on the previous slide. But we go to the marketplace and we find that the bond is actually selling for $1,400. Therefore, the conversion premium would be the market price minus the conversion value or $200. This bond is selling for $200 more than what it could be converted to. Now, this may be a little extreme, but normally there is a conversion premium because it's still a bond. And this uh, we call the conversion equivalent. The price at which the common stock would have to sell in order to make the convertible security worth its present price. And slide 14. Uh, sometimes called conversion parity. You take the market price of the convertible and divide it by its conversion rate. So that same $1,000 bond is selling at a premium of $1,400. 20 to 1 ratio, you divide the 1400 divided by the 20 to 1 ratio, the stock would have to sell at least $70 a share for it to be conversion equivalent. But it's probably not going to be selling for $70 a share because remember we have to worry about that conversion premium. So do all these things make sense, folks? They're actually pretty straightforward. Go back over them and make sure you understand these and you're going to see that the worksheet on chapter 18 is very simple there's an answer key and a commentary and the assignment is very simple in fact it's the easiest five points you'll get all semester long slide number 15 here's a graph that tries to show you how these convertible 
um, bonds work actually out in the marketplace. And you could it could be preferred stock too, but but bond works a little bit better. Remember, it's a bond, and so it's going to be selling for what a bond normally would sell with, and that's the green line. But what if the stock were m much more than the the conversion value were much more than what it would take for you to make sense for it to convert. Well, that would bump up the price of the stock, the, the bond, to this blue line right here. And the blue line would be a little bit more than the stock value because of the conversion premium. And then if the stock were to fall precipitously and fall below what it would take for us to make sense to, to, to convert the bond, well, then remember, it's a bond. It's paying 6 or 7 or whatever, 8%. So it holds its own until such time as the stock recovers and then goes up again. I don't, I don't know. If, you know. Make sure you or look at this graph and see if you can figure it out. It's trying to tell you that it's both a bond, it's a convertible bond, or preferred stock works the same way. And then because it can be converted, if the stock has done really, really well, there'll be a conversion value and that uh, that will you know make our bond worth even more. And then if the stock does fall below that, that, that value, then of course it's still a bond. So if that sh rings your chimes, great. If not, don't worry about it because you and I are probably not going to be investing in these things. Slide number 16, Con bottom line on convertibles, convertible securities allow you to partake in the potential capital appreciation of the common stock with less risk because of the income from the convertible bond or the convertible preferred stock. If the stock price is below the conversion price, then the convertible securities price will be kept up because of its value from producing income. Remember, it's a bond or it's a preferred stock. But, oh, you pay for the reduced risk via the conversion premium. Again, in my humble opinion, is that I, in my humble opinion is that I believe individual retail investors are best served by focusing their attention on common stocks for growth and income and bonds for income. But there are always exceptions. I know of one gentleman who used to, a million years ago, invest in these things and he didn't even think they were that great. <laughs> That's pretty interesting, right? So, yeah. And if you do, please tell me about your, you know, how it works out for you, okay? Slide 17. We are done, folks. We are done with mutual funds. We are done with, with stocks. We are done with bonds. And so now, in our next session, we're going to take a look at diversification and risky asset allocation. We're going to pull it all together so to speak and so i look forward to seeing you in our next presentation see ya